Hi everyone, welcome to another Nerve event and especially welcome to our final Nerve event for 2020. So just as a brief introduction, we are the Neural Engineering Research Venture, bringing neuroscience to life in Africa and around the world. And who are we? Um, Nerve consists of Darvi, myself and Siobhan and Siobhan and I will be your hosts for the evening. Then just a brief overview of how NERV managed to grow over the course of 2020. We are very excited about our global footprint having increased this much, so we are excited to share this map with everyone as our um, sort of final look back on NERV 2020. Then we also want to um, preemptively just ask everyone to send us abstracts if you are at all interested to present at NERV in 2021. So if you have anything that you feel is valid for presentation on our platform, you can send your abstracts to nervegroup.info at gmail.com. But Siobhan will also share this email address in the comments for you. Then we have a couple of announcements. First off, um, check out Worldwide Neuro. This is a platform for sharing a varied collection of neuroscience talks and seminars, and it is all conveniently located in one place. Talks are added and listed daily, so you can find something new there every day. Then also have a look at Worldwide Jobs. This is a neighboring um, branch of Worldwide Neuro or an extension of Worldwide Neuro. And it's an awesome new platform that allows you to look for employment and study opportunities in the field of neuroscience. And this is including, but not limited to postgrad, postdocs and faculty positions. The idea of this network is to provide a safe space where you can post your profile so the perfect opportunities can find you. Then we also have the Simon's Emery workshop on neural dynamics, and this will take place on 4 December through YouTube. The workshop, workshop will center around the question, what could, send, sorry, what could neural dynamics have to say about the neural computation and do we know how to listen? Then, um, because we will be offline for a while until 2021, we have a couple of um, Twitter accounts for you guys to follow. So just to stay in the loop with everything that's happening. So you can check out these handles and Siobhan will also share them in the comments. Um, then I would also like to add that if there is um, any other Twitter accounts that you guys would like to recommend to our audience tonight, please feel free to share them in the comments as well. Okay, then to keep up to date, um, there's some cool online tutorials and Siobhan will share these links in the comments as well. Um, and then, yeah, so please do check them out over the, the coming months until we are back online. And again, if you have any additional recommendations you would like to share with everyone, we do encourage you to add those in the comments. Cool. Then, as always, just a couple of house rules. We ask you to please use respectful and inclusive language as we have a very wide audience. Um, yeah, lots of different people from different backgrounds, so please keep that in mind. Then. Please remember also to ask your questions throughout the talk and post them in the ask a question section and also remember to vote for your favorite questions. And after the presentation, we will invite you to on screen to ask your questions live. If you do not want to ask your questions live, please do remember to add please ask to the questions that you post. And then at the end of the presentation in the Q&A session, the most popular questions are most likely to be asked first. First, okay, then if your connection is slow, Try to refresh your browser. And if this does not work, there's also a option to select the compatibility mode from the audio visual help button in the corner of your screen. And if your connection fails completely, don't worry, the talk will be available to stream after the event. I will now hand over to Siobhan who will be introducing our speaker. Thanks, Julianne. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm very excited to welcome tonight's speaker. Um, Dr. Anu Pretorius, who is a research scientist at InstaDeep, which is based in Cape Town, South Africa. His background is in mathematical statistics, as well as research on the theory of deep neural networks. He completed his PhD in computer science in 2019 at Stellenbosch University under the supervision of Prof. Steve Kroon and Dr. Hermann Kamper. He is also a very happy and active member of the Deep Learning in Davos community and has benefited hugely by learning from its members and mentors. Since joining InstaDeep at the start of 2020, his research interests have expanded to include deep reinforcement learning and more specifically, multi-agent deep reinforcement learning. 
He is primarily interested in these fields for their potential in building adaptable large scale intelligent systems. So thank you very much, Adonu. We're very excited to have you. And um, I invite you to share your, share your screen and start your talk. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I really appreciate the invitation. I also just want to um, congratulate uh, Nerve on uh, a very successful year. Um, I think it's a wonderful initiative and um, I wish you all the best uh, moving forward. Um, can you see my screen? Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, so perhaps just before I get started, I just want to uh, mention a few things and maybe a disclaimer or two. So obviously I'm not a sort of climate scientist uh, at all um, or you know, very knowledgeable in, in that field on a sort of scientific level. Um, but the presentation that touches on climate change is more something that has been sort of like a personal journey for me since uh, about like a year ago or two years ago, uh, reading up about it and uh, just learning more. Um, and so this has been sort of a topic that has uh, interested me a lot uh, recently, uh, which I think is is quite important. And then since uh, having been exposed to these uh, sort of new issues and ideas and uh, having joined InstaDeep, um, I've also you know, s sort of you know, expanded to, to uh, multi-agent reinforcement learning as, as sort of a, a very, I think, promising uh, research area moving forward into the future with huge potential for, uh, you know, uh, potential for impactful applications. Um, so the talk uh, is in three parts. Uh, climate change will be the first, and I'll just quickly give uh, an introduction, um, just a brief introduction. Um, and then we'll move on to uh, basically what I feel or, or some of the bits and pieces around uh, multi-agent learning systems and why they could be useful uh, to, to help tackle uh, big issues in, in climate change. And then uh, the fir third part of the talk will be uh, essentially about some of the research that uh, we've been doing in uh, uh, trying to understand the behavior of uh, network control systems that uh, use uh, sort of reinforcement learning. Um, so in part one, um, like I said, will just be a brief introduction uh, to some of the uh, just basics of uh, climate change. So the data is uh, currently uh, quite uh, clear in terms of uh, rising global temperatures, um, poles are, are melting, um, and these things seem to be uh, correlated with atmospheric CO2 levels being uh, sort of uh, pumped into the atmosphere and increasing rapidly over, over the recent uh, decades. Um, and a common question is, well, is this normal? Um, is, is this not something that uh, is sort of just a natural phenomenon? Um, so what can be done is uh, scientists have looked at uh, sort of variability in uh, CO2 levels over thousands of years by uh, drilling deeply into ice cores and, and measuring the CO2 content uh, captured there. And uh, there seems to be a fair amount of variability uh, over the years where the Earth will move into sort of warm periods, into glacial, and then into ice age periods, uh, glacial periods. Um, so it's fairly uh, clear that there are periods where it used to be cold and then uh, it'll warm up uh, through sort of, uh, you know, uh, what you would call natural causes, uh, especially going back uh, thousands of years. Um, and this seems to be uh, quite correlated with uh, atmosphere uh, sort of temperature levels. So as CO2 content goes up, temperature also goes up and uh, vice versa. Um, and they are sort of physics uh, relating these two uh, quite directly, but uh, obviously in the data, you can just see this for yourself. So the question is why uh, does the variability uh, take place? And it, it turns out that a large amount of variance can be explained through uh, what's called the Milankovitch cycles. So the earth uh, has different 
sort of periods that it goes through cycles that happen over large uh, amount of years. So the one is uh, eccentricity, which is basically just the uh, how elongated or sort of oval shaped the, the orbit is around the sun. Um, and it has sort of like a cycle period of 100,000 years. The tilt of the earth uh, makes a difference. And then precession, which is sort of like wobbling around the, the axis uh, of, of the earth. And these also take uh, on the order of you know, thousands of years to complete a full cycle. And uh, all the other planets and the sun themselves uh, it's, uh, have uh, sort of complicated schedules, but um, this does uh, account for a large amount of variability in, in sort of the changes in uh, the, uh, the um, temperature. But the alarming uh, thing uh, is that recently, if you look maybe uh, just in a few decades, uh, what we're observing is uh, something that is sort of a phenomenon that should be quite alarming um, in terms of uh, an increase at about 100 parts per million uh, of um, uh, CO2 content into the atmosphere in the last 70 years which is uh, about uh, 100 more than the previous highest record uh, in thousands of years that we've uh, monitored this, um, been able to monitor this. And um, due to the correlation with uh, temperature as the CO2 content goes up, well, what's already expected to happen is that uh, the Earth will sort of uh, warm up uh, in terms of um, temperature by about 1 to 1.5 degrees. And um, this might sound small, but uh, there are various uh, systems on the Earth that are uh, within sort of very uh, strict bands of, uh, you could say, like normal operating conditions. And once they move beyond that, uh, it would be have like devastating effects. So one example is, for example, coral reef, uh, if you uh, heat them up by just about one degree, they start a process called bleaching. And then uh, if the temperature does not go down, then uh, they could actually uh, you know, permanently die and never recover. So the lag in, in temperature that uh, we experience, uh, even though we've already pumped quite a bit of CO2 into the atmosphere, but we haven't uh, almost experienced the uh, increase in uh, sort of temperature on the land like day to day that you would you would feel is because most of the the heat gets absorbed by the oceans first so you have sort of uh, uh, shallow level uh, maybe zero to 700 meters deep uh, absorbing most of the heat first in the ocean and then deep levels and then finally it's uh, it's felt uh, on, on land and uh, ice and the rest of the atmosphere. So there's a sort of like lag effect with um, uh, changing temperature that uh, we experience on, on land. And the current science uh, around this, um, which is fairly uh, uncontroversial in, in sort of the scientific community, um, is uh, that there are a few well, basically two possible futures. Uh, the one is that if we are able to curb emissions uh, to have the increase in temperature be around uh, lower than two degrees Celsius um, increase in, in total in future decades, then it might be uh, possible to kind of turn the situation around, have uh, things stabilize and, and go back to the glacial interglacial cycles. Um, but if we do not uh, keep it below something like two degrees, then we are in a situation where so there are run, uh, runoff effects, feedback loops, um, and it becomes uh, far more difficult to try and uh, stabilize uh, things. Um, and the negative effects are, uh, you know, just keep on increases in temperature and, and uh, sea level uh, increases. And um, all these uh, effects uh, in terms of like a time scale if you if you look at the data and uh, the amount of um, uh, emissions that uh, we keep uh, pumping into the into the atmosphere um, the time scale for when uh, there's almost like a no going back 
uh, period or a, a tipping point is uh, within the next um, uh, you know, a few decades. So maybe about uh, 2030 or 2040. Um, and uh, there are some pessimistic um, kind of projections that we might even have uh, an uninhabitable Earth uh, as, as soon as 2050. So here are just a few uh, projections of things that uh, could potentially uh, go wrong as temperatures increase. So uh, it affects things like food, water, ecosystems, uh, the weather. So you can already see at ecosystems, just 1% extensive damage to coral reefs. If we get to about uh, two, two, two degrees uh, increase, um, we can see sort of significant decreases in water availability especially in places like the Mediterranean and Southern Africa. And then as it keeps uh, going on, uh, it will uh, you know, uh, have devastating effect to you know, threatening major cities and uh, these type of things like uh, flooding and mass extinction. The other uh, sort of unfortunate um, note here is that uh, most of the uh, CO2 or, or emissions that are being produced today are in sort of developed countries uh, in the north. Um, but it turns out that the most vulnerable countries are, or actually the sort of entire continents are more to the, to the south. So uh, Africa is particularly vulnerable to sort of like changes in, in climate. And uh, one example would be something like agriculture. So um, it's projected that like agricultural yields will take a huge uh, knock uh, in, in, in a bad way in terms of uh, uh, decreasing as uh, temperatures start to increase. Uh, so these regions are especially uh, sort of vulnerable. So that was just a quick introduction. Um, I definitely encourage you to uh, do some of your own research. Uh, do not just believe me, uh, what I'm saying. Uh, maybe just, uh, yeah, spend some time and see what you can find and, and uh, whether you uh, agree with these things. I think is always important to try and make up your own minds. But um, I think uh, at least from, from my uh, experience looking at the various evidence, uh, I, I think there's uh, definitely sort of an urgency with, with some of the problems that we might be facing in the near future. So in part two, uh, I'm just going to talk a bit about sort of climate resilience and maybe some of my opinions for why uh, multi-agent systems might be useful uh, to look into. Um, so climate resilience uh, essentially breaks down into kind of two broad categories. Um, so mitigation is almost trying to do something about the root causes. Uh, in some sense, um, you're uh, trying to directly reduce emissions, so things like sustainable transport or clean energy. Um, and then adaptation is almost uh, strategies to adapt to uh, changes uh, that, that will be coming due to climate change. So like disaster management programs or, or uh, flood protection, these type of things. And then in between things like education could, could go both ways, uh, inspire someone to either you know, uh, learn more and, and innovate uh, in, in both areas. And then there's a third uh, area not mentioned here called geoengineering, which, which usually refers to almost uh, you know, allowing emissions to keep going, but somehow have uh, advanced technology that can uh, you know, maybe guard us from uh, its effects. So last year, there was a very uh, influential uh, paper that uh, came out um, uh, that sort of looked at this head on in terms of uh, people from the machine learning community uh, trying to get involved. Um, and it included many, many uh, sort of well-known and established researchers like Ang Ring and Demis from DeepMind and Yoshio Benjo and very, very uh, many other researchers from from good institutions like MIT and Stanford. Um, and they wrote this paper about uh, ways or, or opportunities, how uh, machine learning can help tackle uh, issues in, in uh, uh, climate change. And um, 
the uh, specifically like at the intersection of maybe uh, sort of different technologies and what machine learning can can bring to the table. And they highlighted various areas, so like industry, uh, electricity systems, and farms and forests, um, and various sort of subcategories within them. So, for example, like electricity systems, you could, uh, a big problem is even if you have uh, kind of uh, green energy, so maybe you have like wind power, um, but it's uh, sort of dependent on um, the conditions around, so how strong the wind is, which direction, how many uh, uh, turbines do you have actively spinning, some of them might be uh, down needing maintenance, so it's, uh, it's difficult to uh, gauge what the um, amount of electricity would be that would be generated, and because of that, this high variability, you'd have to have uh, other systems in place that can uh, kind of uh, take over once uh, there's unexpected drops in the amount that can be generated. And so something like better forecasting uh, can really help in those areas. So um, I, I personally feel that uh, many of these uh, different um, places where uh, machine learning could uh, help uh, specifically in uh, the area of multi-agent learning systems, I think there's uh, quite a bit of potential because some of these problems are uh, very complex and uh, often map nicely onto the idea of having sort of multiple agents work together and, and, and solve a task. And if you think of uh, maybe the, the, the most intelligent uh, system on earth, uh, maybe it's not sort of the human human brain or, or that, but it's the uh, human uh, society as a collection uh, working together and uh, sort of trying to solve uh, really complicated uh, problems. So the reason uh, this has been something that I've, I've been drawn to is this idea of emergence of innovation uh, through learning. Uh, so DeepMind, has this paper, really nice paper, uh, called like the autocurricula and emergence of innovation from social interaction. And in it, they have this hypothesis, uh, which they call the autocurriculum hypothesis. So I'll just quickly read it. Um, so it says the dynamics arising from competition and cooperation in multi-agent systems provide a naturally emergent curriculum where the solution to one task often leads to new tasks continually generating novel challenges and thereby promoting innovation within the system. So perhaps just as an example, um, you have on the left, maybe just this toy system that uh, is, is interacting uh, with, with other uh, components. So each one is maybe an agent and uh, it consists of sub modules, them themselves interacting. And uh, the idea is that if you uh, perhaps look at this uh, right toy figure and you imagine two just a simplified version of, of something like this where you just have two uh, agents interacting and you have a row agent and a column agent and these capital uh, letters represent sort of these strategies uh, they can uh, use uh, to try and uh, maybe optimize some utility or, or reward or payoff you you, uh, you can uh, specify. And if you look at the uh, row player, if the row player decides to play strategy A, it in a sense uh, provides a challenge to the column player. It's, uh, you can imagine maybe there's some sort of optimization landscape or, or uh, you know, um, could be a loss function of some type. Uh, which uh, the the column player has now uh, an opportunity to kind of try and get to the best strategy. And if the row player is playing uh, A, uh, the column player sort of finds uh, itself uh, in, in this plateau region and maybe uh, given that these payoffs are, are really fairly similar within quite a wide region, there's an indifference between the strategy that the column player would like to play. However, if the row player plays uh, the strategy B, then it uh, completely changes the challenge presented to the column player. And now there's a clear preference between uh, st strategies A and B for the column player. And this forces the column player to now innovate, to find the best strategy, uh, to work out uh, you know, 
what uh, what is the best way to act given that the other player has or agent has acted in a certain way um, and this has actually been uh, demonstrated in some recent work so um, open AI had this very interesting paper where they uh, demonstrated the emergence of tool use and um, essentially what they did is they had uh, these uh, agents so these red agents are uh, seekers uh, these um, blue agents are hiders and the game is of course for the hiders to try stay away from from the seekers and uh, as you would as, as a kid you would start off with with the seekers sort of counting for a bit and then eventually the game starts and they're trying to to find the hiders so the the hiders get a few seconds before the game starts to do things, try and find the best position, and then the seekers will try and and uh, you know uh, find them. And uh, having the system learn uh, throughout just uh, sort of interaction at first, um, eventually what happens is the first strategy to emerge is just pure chasing. So the seekers figure out that they should chase the the hiders, and that's how they can sort of increase their, their payoff or points or rewards. And uh, the um, hiders then sort of learn just basic uh, runaway strategy. But then as learning continues, um, the hiders figure out that they can use these boxes and actually move them to these openings and lock them. And if they're locked, the seekers can't really uh, do anything about that and they're uh, safe inside the room. But once this happens, this presents a new challenge to the seekers. And the seekers then figure out to use this ramp and move it to this wall and to and get inside the room. And uh, this only emerges, this behavior, once the, the hiders have figured out to kind of lock themselves inside the room. But then finally, once uh, this uh, new strategy has emerged, which is now a new challenge for the uh, hiders, uh, the hiders figure out that in, in the few seconds of uh, gameplay while the seekers are you know, counting, let's say, uh, they can uh, move outside of the room and grab the ramp and move it inside first to close the room. Uh, and then they are safe with the seekers uh, not being able to, to get inside. And uh, so this is quite fascinating that, that something like this could emerge just through uh, multi-agent uh, learning. But uh, just a pause on um, thinking about sort of learned systems. Um, if they have great promise, there's also uh, things that we definitely need to think about. So if, if these systems are learning by interacting in dynamically changing environments, and we want to potentially deploy them in things like you know, safety critical operations or managing crucial life supporting resources, these things that definitely would be touched upon if, if you would have uh, you know, uh, applications for, um, for example, climate change adaptation, um, uh, would be uh, you know, uh, resource management. Uh, problems uh, could be considered sort of crucial life supporting uh, resource management uh, issues. And if uh, these systems uh, have any potential to be deployed there, then uh, I feel like it must be quite important to understand uh, sort of how they work, their underlying mechanisms, what's driving the behavior of, of the agents and interactions during learning. Um, so this sort of becomes uh, an important topic so this brings us to um, part three uh, of uh, the talk. Um, and uh, the third is uh, just going to discuss some of the, the research that um, we, we recently did on trying to better understand um, multi-agent reinforcement learning in this context of um, kind of uh, trying to have uh, an example where a system might be useful for uh, a, an, an application that could be kind of uh, uh, beneficial for, for climate change action. Um, but uh, as a specific example, uh, we looked at common pool resource management. Um, so 
this is uh, something that I think is um, very applicable to uh, both um, uh, you know, climate change mitigation strategies and adaptation. So the the paper um, that this work is based off uh, is is was a big collaboration between uh, many researchers. Um, so I just want to uh, give a shout out to uh, the the other authors. Um, so uh, Scott Cameron, Ilan van Buyon, uh, Tom McKink, Shil Moje um, from various universities, uh, Jeremy, uh, Jonathan. Um, all these people really, really contributed a lot to to this work. So this is definitely not um, just uh, uh, something that I'm I'm presenting on my own. Um, and uh, I I think uh, the the uh, collaboration really um, speaks volumes that we have um, so many different universities from from South Africa and um, Scott, who's now in Oxford. Uh, it's, it's a really, I think, a, a step in the right direction and, and something uh, I think uh, we should be proud of that we find more and more collaboration between um, different universities and different researchers all, all over the world. Because uh, I, I definitely feel this is something sort of the deep learning in DARPA has uh, opened up for, for many of us to uh, sort of get to know each other and, and collaborate. So um, I just want to uh, go through sort of uh, what do I mean by common pool resources. So the common pool resources are defined as resources where exclusion from access is difficult or in some cases impossible. Um, and if you extract any of the resource, if you take any, uh, it diminishes what is available to, to the rest of, of the agents or people or, or uh, whoever in this case. Um, and examples are things like arable land, fresh water, um, and even the atmosphere. So if you can think of maybe like the free, available, clean uh, uh, atmosphere space or whatever you could, you'd like to call it, that you can uh, you know, pollute or something, then that's sort of like a, a, a common pool resource. Um, it's very hard to exclude. Uh, uh, actors in, in the world to, to, to partake in uh, use of, of that space. Um, but typically, common pool resources are susceptible to what are called social dilemmas. Um, and it's this interplay between kind of individual short-term uh, interests or um, kind of incentives and long-term uh, group collective interests. Um, and often when this happens, uh, there's uh, this myopic behavior of, of the individuals um, acting uh, out of self-interest uh, creates suboptimal outcome for everyone involved. So even if you act uh, selfishly in, in the beginning, um, it, it is in your best interest to, to like work with the group uh, long term, but it's, it's difficult to... Uh, um, kind of uh, coordinate on, on, on these things. And uh, that's why social dilemmas typically emerge. So a common one is called the tragedy of the commons. Um, so it's something like in this cartoon, someone says, you know, water belongs to anyone. I take as much as I want. Um, and this person on the right uh, says, it seems to be less and less these days. Uh, so maybe the person on the right has a more, you know, sustainable kind of outlook, just Takes what they need every uh, what they need every day, and uh, you know has a sort of uh, sustainable ex extraction uh, um, you know strategy, and uh, the the other person just feels you know they can they should take as much as they they can because uh, you know it's available to everyone and no one can can stop them. But then in the long run, uh, perhaps it runs out, and then both uh, are sort of out of luck, whereas usually uh, with these type of resources, there's sort of like a natural regeneration rate uh, that pl takes place. So if you uh, can keep uh, taking at a sort of sustainable rate, then uh, you, you are guaranteed to be uh, well off uh, into the long term. So our research question was um, something along the lines of, um, you know, if we have uh, um, 
common pool resources and uh, the management of these resources are pretty difficult. Um, maybe, you know, you need sort of institutional level uh, policy or uh, there needs to be some rules set in place and uh, definitely, uh, you know, human uh, uh, institutions consisting of rational agents uh, have been demonstrated to be susceptible to uh, social dilemmas. So um, the question was that if if we we have a situation where you know we want a common pool resource to be managed by by something like uh, you know learned system, um, if we replace uh, you know maybe this heuristic or policy strict rule uh, system that that uh, some institution set up and and we we slot in a multi agent reinforcement learning approach. Uh, would this also be susceptible to uh, social dilemmas? Would the system be able to escape and uh, just uh, in, in, a, in a meaningful way be, be capable of uh, learning sustainable strategies uh, for all the agents involved? Or is it actually uh, not, not so simple that um, multi-agent RL is, is also um, uh, open to, to falling into these traps? We uh, decided to, to um, as a as a test bed of of, of sorts, um, an example. We built this modified water management system. So we said, okay, we will we will consider um, a water treatment plant, and uh, we uh, have sort of the water regenerate at certain rates based on you know, the various sources. Um, and the control components of the system are the agents. So we have uh, these shuttle valves uh, that can open and close. And uh, those uh, valves themselves represent the different agents. And the agent actions are just simply opening or closing the valve. And reward is given to, to the agent based on how much the agent can uh, supply in terms of uh, the amount of water to, to its respective society. So the more water it can send to either, you know, like in this case, the one agent goes to industry or the other to housing, uh, the more reward the agent gets. But from the perspective of each agent, um, the uh, water in, in the treatment plant is, is a common pool resource. So uh, they can't directly uh, shut uh, each other off. Um, and if they uh, take, there is less uh, left to be taken by any other agent. And so the, the task here is to try to learn how to, uh, you know, uh, try to um, provide as much water to each respective society, but also do so sustainably so that in the long run, uh, the water uh, does not run out. Um, so we wanted to know how uh, these systems would fare if, uh, we were to to analyze them uh, in terms of uh, uh, categorizing as, uh, the existence of a social dilemma uh, in their behavior. And the go-to or most mature uh, kind of uh, theory for analyzing multi-agent uh, interaction uh, is probably game theory. And um, the uh, game theory usually gets introduced uh, using this uh, this game, a matrix game called the Prisoner's Dilemma. Um, so I'll just quickly use this to to introduce uh, some of the key concepts. So the story behind the Prisoner's Dilemma is that you you basically have two uh, uh, people who committed a crime and they may be in um, holding cells at the moment and they're being interrogated and um, they can either confess to the crime uh, or they can stay silent and uh, this is represented by the two players. So this row player has uh, cooperate, which is essentially confess, uh, defect, which is uh, to, um, uh, uh, um, oh, sorry, co cooperate is, is to stay quiet, and defect is to, uh, to confess. And we have the, the same symmetrical situation for the row player. And so if, uh, in this case, uh, usually uh, payoffs are represented in terms of like the higher number is um, uh, is a better uh, situation to be in. 
Uh, but as the prisoner's dilemma is usually represented, you you kind of think in terms of years in prison. So if they um, uh, both stay quiet, uh, they maybe spend only a few years in prison, which is a higher payoff of three uh, for each player. Uh, if the one um, uh, villain or, or a person who committed the crime rats on the other, then, for example, uh, the column player uh, confesses, uh, whereas the um, the uh, row player uh, stays quiet, then the row player will receive uh, many years in prison, a very low payoff, and the column player uh, might go free or might get a very low sentence for actually cooperating with the police, in this case, uh, confessing. And then you have the symmetrical situation uh, for uh, column to row or row to column. And finally, the, the last uh, cell here is when um, both players uh, confess and uh, they then get a score of one. So they go to uh, prison for a certain amount of years. And what makes the prisoner's dilemma uh, a social dilemma first and, and also an interesting uh, game to look at is that if you analyze the, the, the strategy to each uh, player, what you will find is that uh, if the, for example, column player plays the strategy to cooperate, the best the row player can do is to defect because it will prefer a payoff of five over a payoff of three. If you fix the, or the column player strategy to defect, uh, you find a similar situation where the, the dominant strategy for um, the uh, column, uh, the row player is to defect. Um, and to get a payoff of one instead of uh, instead of zero. And so irrespective of the strategic action of the column player, the row player will always play defect. And this is the same uh, situation that happens with the um, uh, symmetrically with the column between uh, the row player. And uh, so the equilibrium point for this game is actually at a, a point where both uh, players are um, uh, confessing and getting a lower payoff than they would have if they both cooperated. And you can um, actually sort of define uh, any social dilemma in, in a similar way. So there are specific conditions to, um, to social dilemmas. The first condition is uh, that like full cooperation is preferred to uh, defection. So you have the situation where you would rather have uh, all players cooperate instead of uh, all players uh, defect in terms of payoffs. The second condition is you would rather have everyone um, cooperate than uh, being exploited by a defector. So this is saying you, you'd rather have be in this situation where everyone's cooperating, for example, from the row player's perspective, than being uh, exploited by the column pa player and, and getting a zero. And then the final condition is to say, uh, there should be sort of situations in, in strategic play where there's incentive to defect. So uh, in this case, for, for both the row and the uh, column player, uh, in, in this top left cell, there's uh, incentive to, to defect, to move away from uh, this uh, uh, both cooperating uh, uh, point. Um, and if you have these three conditions, uh, you, you can classify uh, the game as being a social dilemma. But the issue with um, sort of standard, uh, almost uh, sort of classical game theory is uh, there's a lot of tools that you can use for analyzing uh, simple games with uh, atomic actions like cooperate effect, uh, various matrix games. But once you move to a system that's quite complex, where uh, it's uh, sequential in nature. There are uh, many different actions that agents can take and uh, entire policies are, are being learned. Um, it, it's, uh, it becomes more difficult to use sort of classical uh, game theory to, to try and understand these systems. So uh, basically our problem was that the, the underlying agent incentives in complex learn systems are, are quite difficult to, to analyze, so you need to sort of move uh, to, to a new uh, toolbox. Um, and this comes through uh, empirical game theoretic analysis, which is um, this neat idea where you uh, can essentially um, 
uh, estimate uh, a meta level game. So payoffs uh, in, in, in sort of like a, a, a meta game that uh, will then represent uh, the actual condensed version of uh, interactions between agents that have a far more sort of uh, sequential nature and, and interaction. And so one way you can do this is uh, you can essentially manipulate uh, systems uh, or, or your environment conditions in such a way that you are fairly certain the behavior that's being learned by your agents will correspond to certain um, kind of classes where uh, if, if you have um, uh, 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 control and uh, you have some knowledge of the dynamics of the game, uh, there might be uh, ways where you can expect a certain behavior to arise if you if you change the environment in certain ways. And I'll, I'll show just in a, in a second, um, in our case, how, how this was done. And then once you have labeled these, um, these uh, uh, strategies, uh, so you have essentially an entire policy which you, which you label as cooperate uh, or defect, for example, you can then play uh, them out uh, in, in evaluation rounds. And once you have done this, you, you can estimate essentially the, the payoffs uh, over multiple runs uh, uh, of evaluation uh, between uh, sort of uh, full policies and uh, get then sort of a meta level uh, game like this. And once you do this, uh, if you find that the payoffs, uh, estimated payoffs correspond or, or they, they match these three conditions, then uh, this game becomes uh, what's called the social, uh, sequential social dilemma. So um, here, Markov games is essentially the, the space in which uh, multi-agent RL uh, finds itself, um, sequential Markov games. And then if you do empirical game theoretic analysis where you find that the estimated matrix payoffs uh, correspond uh, to uh, conditions that, that meet the social dilemma conditions, then it sort of uh, maps back and you can say, well, you are dealing with a sequential uh, social dilemma. So I, I hope that uh, uh, that makes sense. Um, so uh, in our case, what we had to do is uh, we had this water uh, treatment uh, plant uh, and um, this a small simplified version of it and we had valves uh, for agents so what we could do is we could manipulate the regeneration rate in the plant so if we had a high regeneration rate we could expect agents to learn to take all the time because there's no reason not to there will always be water and the agents can just uh, learn this uh, sort of strategy of take 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 um, whereas if the regeneration rate was said to be uh, quite low the agents would have to learn to uh, to be more sustainable, maybe take some time uh, and then uh, shut off for a while and then take again. And the idea is that if you have these two uh, strategies emerging through manipulating the regeneration rate, then we can label them uh, as being for either cooperative or, or, or defecting um, under kind of uh, normal conditions. So imagine, um, everyone uh, trained in the uh, high regeneration rate uh, could um, then under normal conditions be seen as greedy agents. So if there's, um, uh, if there's no unlimited water anymore and the agent has learned the policy where it would just always take, then we can label that policy as, as playing a defecting strategy. And then the vice versa in terms of uh, cooperative uh, strategies for uh, low regeneration rates. And then what we can do is we can evaluate these different uh, learned uh, agents uh, in, in, um, in the system, and then we can estimate payoffs. And instead of a matrix, uh, we, we had a multiplayer uh, game. So uh, in this case, four agents. So we uh, didn't represent it in terms of like a two by two uh, matrix, but instead using uh, shelling diagrams. So, um, I can just quickly uh, explain this uh, shelling diagram. This red uh, curve is uh, the estimated payoff for um, a defecting agent. And on the x-axis, we have number of cooperators. 
So in this case, there are zero cooperators, everyone is defecting, and this point would be sort of the average payoff uh, for a defecting player in such a system. Whereas if we move to one cooperator, uh, this point over here is the average payoff for a defector uh, in, in the system of three uh, defecting and one cooperating. And this green line is the average payoff uh, for uh, cooperators. And so in this uh, scenario, uh, this is uh, what a cooperator would get. Um, and this blue line is simply just the average payoff uh, for uh, all the agents. Um, and how to uh, essentially uh, read uh, the uh, incentives here is you can start at any point. So for example, if we start here, where everyone is cooperating, uh, there is clear incentive for uh, an agent to start defecting. Because if an agent starts defecting, then it moves to a different uh, system where now we have uh, three cooperators and one defector, but the defector getting a higher payoff than uh, it would have if, uh, if it was uh, cooperating. And then uh, from this point, even there's uh, more incentive uh, to keep defecting. So if there's a cooperator in, in this, uh, in this uh, configuration, it has incentive to move uh, to, to defect. And if you go through um, uh, multiple uh, areas of, this, uh, of, of these uh, sort of uh, incentives, you end up at this point where um, there's no incentive for this uh, cooperating player to start defecting because it will move to a lower point. Um, and there's no incentive for this uh, defector or defectors in the system to start cooperating because it will get a lower uh, payoff if it moves from, from this uh, three defecting, one cooperating to two defecting and uh, two cooperating. And so here is the equilibrium point of, of uh, of uh, um, this sort of uh, different configurations that, that can be tested and the incentives that the different players have. And these lines here represent um, essentially the conditions uh, for, for a sequential social dilemma. So C1 was um, you know, full system cooperation is preferred to full system defection. And then C2 was the, the second condition and C3 is, is measured wherever there's a there's sort of an incentive to defect. And so we had this SSD indicator showing that you know, if these uh, values were essentially like positive, so you can think of the slope and, and maybe the gap here as, uh, as, as the values calculated. Uh, if they all three uh, uh, were on this side, then we could uh, say that the system is susceptible to uh, you know, a social dilemma. So just to uh, quickly like revisit the the research question here. Um, the uh, the idea was that we'd have sort of these you know known examples of, of humans uh, being susceptible to social dilemmas, and these dilemmas depend on like their payoffs, which depend on policies. And for human beings, uh, policies you can argue is, is sort of a extension of evolved uh, cognition. Whereas for oral agents, the question is that if you have information structures that we can design, uh, so we can design these systems ourselves, uh, would you still get something like sequential social dilemmas arising um, for uh, multi-agent oral systems uh, in common pool resource management? So we, we looked at um, some of the uh, sort of most uh, state-of-the-art uh, multi-agent oral algorithms. Um, and this is all prior work from, from uh, uh, other uh, labs and, and universities that uh, developed various different sort of approaches to multi-agent RL. But they fall roughly into two categories. Um, so the one is uh, where agents um, kind of try and coordinate, but they essentially have a direct information sharing. So they'll share uh, observations or uh, policy information. Um, and uh, some of these algorithms have various sort of like weight sharing uh, things that they uh, employ. And the other uh, set of algorithms had um, sort of learned communication protocols beyond just sharing direct information. So you'd have uh, agents kind of learning message representations uh, that could be useful when, uh, when trying to make decisions. And then they would 
send each other sort of like learned uh, messages uh, to try and uh, improve their, their coordination. So um, in terms of uh, uh, trying out these uh, different uh, uh, classes of algorithms in, in uh, the approach that we just outlined, uh, doing empirical game theoretic analysis, uh, what exactly did we find? Um, so the first was that uh, what was interesting is they definitely showed distinct behavior based on sort of these broad two classes that I spoke about. So direct information sharing and, and learned communication. Um, the algorithms that uh, did not have uh, any communication seem to, um, so I'm just going to explain here, this is uh, the regeneration rate of the environment going from high uh, to low. And uh, these are the, the different algorithms, these three uh, being uh, non-commutative and and uh, these, uh, excuse me, yeah, this is also non-commutative and the, these uh, communicate. Um, so one thing that was interesting is that um, the non-communicating algorithms seem to um, show far uh, uh, more, like more restraint quicker on as you kind of reduce the regeneration rate. So it's almost like the, the strategy without uh, high levels of communication is to uh, be careful, um, whereas uh, our hypothesis for why um, algorithms could, could stay quite uh, sort of um, uh, uh, low in terms of their restraint. So here restraint is just measured in terms of how often um, uh, they take of the resource um, is, is sort of increased coordination between communicating algorithms. And then over here, the what was interesting is that um, the uh, the uh, tragedy of the commons seem to uh, kick in. So you have a very low regeneration rate and then suddenly um, the, uh, the algorithms move uh, far away from being um, quite restrained, uh, taking very little of the resource to being quite greedy. So almost like realizing there's very little to go by. So the best strategy to do is just to take as much as you can as quickly as you can. Um, so like I said, we, we our th theory was that communication uh, leads to better coordination. So we measured something called sustainability, which is essentially like how how far into an episode or 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 a uh, evaluation run uh, do you still receive reward, and and uh, how how spread out is is the the rewards that you are getting. And indeed, uh, we found uh, sort of these um, uh, communication algorithms being uh, quite uh, uh, like. Uh, just uh, better in terms of sustainability uh, at equilibrium, especially, uh, except uh, sort of this outlier uh, case, uh, high variance with a uh, networked uh, ATC. However, most uh, systems still had uh, inefficiency. So you would find situations where the equilibrium is, is not uh, where it would be best for all uh, the, the uh, players on average. Um, so the algorithms that we tested uh, definitely were, uh, you know, uh, uh, susceptible to SSDs, and uh, the equilibriums that they presented uh, uh, would um, uh, definitely be uh, inefficient. Um, and even when uh, communicating, so in communicating algorithms, um, the same would be seen. So here, uh, even though the payoff um, is perhaps the largest with with some variance in terms of like the different configurations you you could argue that it's still inefficient in terms of inequality so if there's one defector who is um, essentially piping a lot of water to its a sector uh, at the uh, at the expense of of three other uh, sectors uh, this is maybe not uh, the best outcome uh, for for the system to be kind of uh, incentivized to to learn um, and then finally, what was very interesting is we, we managed to uh, find one example of an algorithm, uh, the newest one uh, proposed called Neurocom, where uh, it managed to escape the, the SSD uh, trap and uh, learned uh, or, or had sort of uh, uh, this gradual incentives that to, to always uh, cooperate more until the point where the equilibrium was at. Uh, full uh, system cooperation also corresponding to the highest payoff uh, for all. 
So just to conclude, um, I spoke a little bit about climate change. I really uh, you know, uh, encourage uh, anyone here to uh, look into that uh, a bit more if, if you have time. Um, and then uh, climate resilience. Uh, my hope or, or uh, you know, my opinion is that uh, multi-agent systems can have great potential in this area, um, but we must have them be safe and, and work as we expect them to work. Um, and this for, for this research was basically uh, exercising interoperability, asking the question of uh, can multi-agent RL avoid SSDs? Uh, and the answer is uh, not always, uh, depends uh, strongly on uh, the information structures that they uh, employ. Uh, here are some references and resources uh, on climate change. So there's like climate change AI, it's uh, pretty good, and skeptical science, and uh, the IPCC is uh, good, good literature. Um, yeah, so that's if you want to look more into that. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Avnu. It was a very cool talk. <laughs> Pleasure. Um, yeah, happy to take questions. I don't know if there's any, I think this is one question. <laughs> yes, there is one. I'm just quickly going to invite Siobhan back on again. I see she dropped offline now. Um, let me just see if I can get her back online. And then she can run the, the Q&A for us. Okay, she is connecting now. Yeah, but this was very, very interesting and obviously very topical as well in today's yeah. climate, unintended. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, uh, yeah, like I said, it's uh, a, a new venture for myself as well. So um, by all means, I'll try my best to answer your questions, but uh, if you, uh, yeah, if there's something that I can't answer, then uh, I would uh, really urge you on to go, you know, delve into the research and the and the resources. Um, no, that's perfect. Thanks. Sorry, I'm just in the background trying to see. Okay, Siobhan is back here. Let's try again. If it doesn't work, then I'll just ask the question. It's no big deal, but I think Siobhan will appreciate some screen time for the final event. <laughs> cool. cool. Here we go. Okay, I'm just going to... Oh, you're back. Hey. Yeah, hi. Oh, that was a great talk. Uh, super interesting. Oh, thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Um, I'm going to start with my question because it's like a very basic one. Um, and okay. my oral knowledge is, is a bit dodgy. And I'm also reading um, super intelligence. So that makes me even more dangerous when I start asking questions. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm just curious about when you set up these multi agents, um, like right at the beginning, uh, do they kind of get set up individually, and then with the idea that they know that there's other agents? So I'm just thinking about their um, learning their optimal policies and things like that, how all mm. that is um, started. Yeah, so so there's uh, quite a few uh, kind of like paradigms to multi agent RL. Uh, the most basic you can think of is just uh, independent agents. So you just have agents uh, that are um, essentially like their own single agent RL uh, agents trying to optimize their own reward. Uh, they condition on local uh, observations. Um, but perhaps you might have some weight sharing of some kind and then that kind of like influences so people can or the agents can kind of learn to to coordinate. So that's the most basic. But uh, the, the probably the biggest uh, or most popular paradigm in, in multi-agent RL is what's called um, centralized training, decentralized execution. So the idea is that you you have um, uh, different agents uh, that have their own uh, almost like actors. Uh, uh, so the policies they learned are conditioned on local information only. But then uh, you have uh, a critic, uh, which is usually some like learned value function that conditions on information of uh, all the agents. So during uh, training, 
what happens is there's almost like this hive mind that can uh, you know look at what everyone's doing, gather all the information around, and then uh, give feedback to all the uh, individual agents to to have them uh, improve their policies. But the, the the nice thing is that once once you've done this, once you've uh, sort of have uh, policies learned in this way, you can then um, discard the the uh, kind of uh, global information critic. And now you have independent uh, learned uh, policies that can execute, uh, you know, without having to to kind of interact with each other. Um, yeah, so that's one way. And then you have another way. You have agents that can be connected over a network, and then it's sort of like message passing happening all the time. And uh, yeah, and um, so there's different levels of awareness between agents of like what other agents are doing and and how much uh but that that that's almost like where I'm, I'm i was trying to get out with the talk is like we we as humans we've we've almost like been through a uh, a, a greedy optimization process to get where we have certain, um, you know, co cognitive capabilities and we have language and, and we can cooperate based on um, almost like a, a, a design that we don't have so much uh, uh, in terms of a say of how to change. But if we design systems, we can have them share whatever we we want them to share, or we can uh, we, we we can bake in whatever we we want. So it could be that if there are issues with how us humans manage things or trying to to solve complex tasks, maybe if we can you know have uh, other systems uh, be designed uh, in I don't know more robust ways or something. Uh, yeah, but it's it's uh, very yeah not well defined. Um, yeah, that, that, that's super interesting. Um, the other question that I had was um, it just kind of, again, with the, the policies um, and, and these agents, because the reason I mentioned the book is because that's where I got the idea from. They um, talk about perverse instantiation, where the agent kind of interprets the goal to their in their own way that just and then they can just kind of game the system and like just immediately go for the reward. Um, yeah. So, do you have? How do you? Especially when you are dealing with more than one agent, how does like? Do you have any controls in place for that? Uh, well, I guess any uh, RL kind of task. I mean, there's lots of these uh, examples where you know funny things happen. Uh, there's a glitch in the game, and 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 then uh, you know the agent discovers the glitch, and that's how it kind of figures out how to maximize reward. And and um, I guess the from from the super intelligence point of view or 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 you know long term agi there, there's that whole like value alignment problem right so it's like can you can you sensibly align uh you know objective functions with um like what we truly mean when we say do x or do y or you know we want this to happen or please manage this for me it's uh you know, is it very, uh, is it at all possible to to kind of like solve the, the value alignment problem? Um, and I think that's still completely like open um, and, and whether it's at the level of almost like internal reward hacking for agents um, or the agent discovering something in its environment that you as a designer didn't even know exists. Um, I think both those uh, things are, are almost, um, like already, like not even looking into the future, like long-term value alignment issues. Those are issues that that could be, you know, happening right now. Where if you d design something and and you you got maybe the the reward function wrong, um, yeah, it could have like uh, really uh, you know, bad consequences. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, I think. It, a part of uh, like the whole journey of learning more about RL for me and and especially multi agent is is uh, there's huge potential but there's also uh, a lot of things that still need to be kind of uh, thought about and worked out and and once you have systems learn you 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 open the box of wow it can really solve extremely complicated problems if it, if we let it learn. Um, but then you also uh, release uh, some sense uh, interoperability and control of like what's going on. Great, thank you. Um, cool. We have two questions from Avishka. Um, so oh, the first cool. one is. Thanks, Avishka. <laughs> um, since this is a control system setting, 
I imagine you could also model it as a single agent or multi-arm bandit problem. What advantages does modeling as a multi-agent system give you? Yeah, so I think um, the, it touches again upon um, like uh, centralized training and uh, decentralized execution, these type of things where often the problem with um, like modeling as a single agent is you get uh, like scaling issues. So you might have, uh, if you say it's a single agent, you can then say, okay, well, let's condition on all observation information. Uh, we have our actions just be um, basically output uh, all the individual actions that you would have as the individual agent. Um, but then the system scales poorly. So if you can have kind of expensive training, maybe where you're sharing like global information, but then you, you're you allowed to, in some sense, uh, once agents are trained, let them act uh, independently, uh, decentralized, then uh, it's, it's something, it's sort of like a solution that maybe during execution can scale much better if you uh, if you do it that way, um, in terms of like you know large large systems, but I think if the if the problem's small, um, then definitely maybe there's there's uh, you know very little need to move away from uh, maybe if you only have three or four agents, then you can easily uh, model it as a, a single agent system. But uh, d depending on constraints as well, maybe there are some real world constraints that don't allow you to share certain uh, pieces of information like. You know, maybe the components are extremely far away and you have bandwidth issues or something like this and then you you need to change uh, in terms of like how you how you model things um, but yeah you can easily like mathematically also look at uh, multi-agent in in sort of like a single agent sense um, by just uh, having all observations be the state and uh, the actions uh, that are being put out to sort of like the dictionary of actions for each agent something like that yeah I hope that was okay. <laughs> yeah, that was a great answer. Thank you. Or well, at least I think so. We can wait for comments. Okay. Um, then uh, could you please talk more about the topic of fairness and how this can be measured and or encouraged in a, a multi-agent system? I'm assuming fairness is not necessarily the same as sustainability. Uh, yeah, so uh, I, don't, I don't know a lot about like, um, you know the I guess the the sort of fairness literature within machine learning and and uh, where that is at and and all the theories around that. But um, so I don't have uh, concrete thoughts on how you could um, almost uh, incentivize systems in in uh, in multi agent RL to specifically almost have like part of its optimization uh, be have some fairness criteria, um, but. Uh, like low hanging fruit just off the top of my head is is essentially having um a, a, one one way is is uh you have shared rewards so some so somehow you kind of like you know uh, the better the group does the better everyone does uh and and you can um you know uh, try and and incentivize through like uh, reward design um but yeah sometimes uh, i guess like interesting things can still happen where uh, maybe a, a agent figures out that uh, it should just completely stop what it's doing and hand over all control to another agent because if that agent uh, does what it does really good, uh, then uh, the, the group, even though uh, like they, they're sharing a reward, it's, it's uh, uh, better for the other agent to do uh, nothing. Like th there's this uh, no guarantee that even if you, if you share a reward that uh, this could happen. So I... Yeah, off the top of my head, I'm not uh, entirely like I'm sure how I would, but I think it's a really, of course, like a very important topic. And um, yeah, I think uh, there's, I hope at least there's people like looking at this. <laughs> yeah, in multi agent or I'll, I've, I haven't seen much. Uh. Awesome. Um, then we have a, a question from Amal, who um, thanks you for a great talk and uh, um, says that this is a very new topic to him. Um, and he's taken some notes from your presentation about references and things like that. But he is interested in um, if you have any resources that you can recommend that he can, in his words, get my hands dirty with the implementation. Oh, implementation. OK. Uh, I mean, the best, if, if I were you, I would uh, like, you know, just multi-agent RL, GitHub, 
and uh, see what repos you see and uh, if, if there's interesting things you can look at. But um, there are a couple of review papers. Um, so their exact names like ex escape my mind, but they'll have lots of uh, references. Uh, so like multi-agent reinforcement learning, um, there's a critique, uh, there's uh, survey papers, a couple that have been out uh, recently. So like 2019, 2020, um, that, that should be uh, good places to start. And uh, implementations, uh, if you if you want a good implementation, like a nice repo to look at. Uh, so Shyman Whiteson, he's, uh, he's sort of the head of uh, an Oxford uh, group that does a lot of work in, in multi-agent RL. And they have a, a repo called PyMoral. So like Py, like Python, P-Y, and then M-A-R-L uh, for multi-agent RL. And, um, that repo specifically implements a few of uh, the well-known algorithms. So, um, for example, QMix is a is a very popular multi-agent RL algorithm, and then there's a, a one called uh, Qtran and and these type of things. But um, the way the the code's written is really nice. So, if I was uh, to go about sort of uh, trying to copy uh, a repo's uh, you know approach to to just uh, making things modular and having things work quite nicely uh, and slot in and out, I think they did a good job there. So if you want uh, sort of from a coding uh, view, then uh, I would recommend looking at their repo. Yeah. Uh, I guess I can put like a, a um, let me just see if I can put a thing in, in the comments. Yeah, that'd be great. I'd try to do a, a Google myself, but I, um, uh, I found yeah. the specific repo. Uh, there we go. I think. <laughs> cool. Cool. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, that was really great. A really great event. So a great way to round up the year. Um, I'm gonna hand um, over to Julianne. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. No, I just also wanted to thank. Thank you so like. Thank you, and thank you so much for uh, you know inviting me. And uh, yeah, it's been uh, really nice to to, to be here. And uh, I feel um, yeah, uh, really, I think it's an awesome uh, initiative that you that you guys started. So um, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. We really appreciate that. <laughs> and then yeah, from my side as well. Thank you for a great talk. And. Then and I'm just going to ask our audience to also please give Dr. Pretorius a virtual round of applause. And for the last time for 2020, thank you all for attending um, and for being our audience throughout the year. And also please do check out the call to action button at the bottom of the screen, the green button there. Um, it's a link to subscribe to NERVS event calendar. So if you do, then you will be informed automatically when we update our events for 2021. And then we also want to send out one last survey just to collect some feedback from all of you guys on what we can improve and what you liked um, and whether we'll be seeing you in 2021. So do keep an eye out in your inbox for that. It should appear in the next couple of days. And um, lastly, I would like to thank our sponsors, Stellenbosch University and the Biomedical Engineering Research Group. Um, yes, and thank you to all of you again for joining us in 2020, and we hope to see all of you in 2021. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye. Bye.